New Scotland Yard, synonymous with excellence in crime solving, recognised as a world leader in murder investigation. Every year, New Scotland Yard's experienced detectives unravel the twisted truth from the tragedies that unfold across the bustling capital city of London. Uncovering evidence that nails the guilty beyond all reasonable doubt takes time, dedication and a forensic attention to detail. This is New Scotland Yard Files. Tonight, a popular young woman. Everyone tells me at the moment she seemed like such a lovely girl, she was so pretty. She served as a special constable, working unpaid as a police officer to protect her community from harm. This was one of our own. But she was killed in her own home. There are some murders that are so difficult to comprehend, they sent shockwaves throughout the community. The killing of Nisha Patel Nasri did exactly that. Not only was it a senseless loss of life, but it made her neighbours wonder if they could be next. It would take detailed and painstaking work from dedicated homicide detectives at New Scotland Yard to find out who killed Nisha Patel Nasri. On a respectable suburban street in North London, most people have gone to bed when blood-curdling screams break the midnight quiet. As Nisha Patel Nasri runs from her house, screaming and bleeding profusely from a fatal stab wound, neighbours call 999. I heard a horrendous scream. I grabbed my dressing gown and ran out. I said, down to my son. I said, I said, come with me quickly. I said, you hear the screams? He said, yes. And then people were coming out and I ran up and I seen the blood was all over, you know, the front here. And I thought it was a passerby. And they said, no, the girl is lying there. So she was lying in, kind of, in her driveway. The wound was inflicted with such force that it severed an archery and Nisha Patel Nasri was left dying here on the driveway of her home. Popular, hardworking and with no known enemies, Nisha was just 29 years old with everything to live for. Police are now faced with the horrific news of the death of one of their own. I can remember three police officers dying during my service. So over the last 40 years, I can remember where I was when I heard about the deaths of three police officers. This was just a young female police officer being killed in the middle of the night. An absolutely horrific crime, but made worse because it's one of your own, people who you work with and, and people who have, you've known for many years. A special occupies a unique place on the force. They are unpaid, but have all the powers of a salaried officer. They are treated as part of the team. New Scotland Yard's Detective Chief Inspector Nick Scola led the Met investigation into Nisha's murder. I was the on-call senior investigating officer at the time when I first heard about this murder. At about midnight, I got a pager message to ring officers who are at the scene. Any major crime scene demands a lot of manpower. As first responders, local police and paramedics leave the scene of Nisha's killing, murder detectives and forensic scientists rapidly move in. At an incident such as the murder of Nisha Patel Nashri, the scenes of crime officers would attend very shortly after the investigating officer or the first officer on scene. Their job is to secure the scene, make sure the job scene is properly secured. Called to the scene by neighbours, Nisha's distraught husband and brother arrived separately within minutes of the attack. Husband Faddy had been playing snooker with a friend, while Nisha's brother Caton 
ran from his home just two streets away. As I was running towards my sister's house, it was cordoned off. And as I was running, I saw a trail of blood. Both men followed the ambulance that transports Nisha to a nearby hospital. But despite the best efforts of paramedics and doctors, she dies less than an hour later from massive blood loss caused by the severing of an artery in her groin. I knew that she would have made it. I knew deep down that she did. She, she could have made it. She would have made it. And especially after going to the house and seeing the amount of blood on the pavement and on the driveway, I just knew when we got to the hospital, the doctor said the words and that was it really. This was your typical quiet suburban neighbourhood. Nothing ever happened. It had a very low crime rate. Then you have this terrible murder. I mean, it left everybody on edge. People were suspicious of their neighbours. This happened in Nisha's home. Next morning, shell-shocked neighbours try to come to terms with the horror of what they've seen. I think she was a uh, heart in stomach. The so blood was just running past, passing very fast, yeah, from our stomach and all. Nisha's home is now a murder scene, and investigators must start the painstaking job of collecting evidence that might help them track down a brutal killer. The forensics team start their search from where Nisha collapsed. They would then proceed inside the house and examine the various relevant parts there and ensuring they take all the exhibits that are required for them. All the time taking photographs, making notes of what they're finding. Journalist Chris Summers followed the twists and turns of the investigation from the outset and remembers the case well. I was working a, a night shift the, the night when Nisha was killed and I remember it, it, it hit the headlines, you know, began to snowball quite quickly. A, a police officer off duty had been murdered and everybody began to wonder what the motive was. Was there any connection with the police force, with her job? Clearly, when we start to investigate a murder, the background of the victim is a significant line of inquiry, especially where the motive for a murder, as was the case with this one, isn't known. We have to look into that background to see if the motive exists in either her personal life or her professional life. Nisha and her husband seemed like a perfect couple. They'd only been married about three years. Busy, sociable and well-known in their neighbourhood, the newlyweds were striving to create a more comfortable future for themselves. On top of being a special constable, she's also a hairdresser who operated her own business from her parents' home that had been left to her and her brother. And she worked very hard at that business. Nisha's husband, Faddy, is also a budding entrepreneur. He ran a limousine firm, limousine hire firm. They seem to be sort of fairly affluent and happy. People described how loving they were. They seemed to be very much in love with each other, holding hands, laughing together. Friends and family saw Nisha and Faddy as a devoted couple. Just the night before the murder, they'd celebrated their third wedding anniversary with a romantic meal, making Nisha's killing even more poignant. There was no sign of any damage to Nisha's house. There's no sign of any damage to the vehicles outside. The husband had this limousine business, so, you know, the big cars, they attracted quite a bit of attention. At the beginning, it was assumed it was a burglary gone wrong. It was something to do with the husband's business. In searching Nisha's home, police quickly notice a large knife is missing from a rack in her kitchen. From this obvious clue, they start building a picture of the events of that terrible night. There are a lot of champagne glasses in the kitchen around where the knife was, and they were undisturbed, which meant whoever took the knife out wasn't doing so in a struggle, otherwise they'd have been knocked over. So that knife took on a significance, so part of the search strategy was to find that knife. 
Investigators know the missing knife from Nisha's kitchen is key to uncovering the mystery of who killed her. Any information from the public could be critical. Clearly at this time, we cannot locate it. I'm asking for anybody who may have found a similar knife. It may have been covered in blood. So they persuade Nisha's grieving husband, Faddy, to make an appeal for witnesses. Obviously, someone's got a guilty conscience. Um, someone has got to know something. Who lives around them, a neighbor, or seen some blood, or someone acting suspiciously or nervous. It might not be important, but just give us a call and let us know. This seemingly random murder of a young policewoman in a quiet suburban street was about to take a much darker turn. Special Constable Nisha Patel Nasri has been fatally stabbed on her doorstep in a quiet residential street in Wembley, a suburb of North London. Police soon establish that at the time of her murder, she was a popular, hard-working young woman with no known enemies, and is happily married to her husband, Fadi Nasri. Fadi, who was playing snooker at the time of her murder, is helping police with their investigation. Obviously, someone's got a guilty conscience. She had a good heart, always very, very bubbly, always willing to help everyone. Everyone's grieving and uh, missing her very much. Police are working on the theory that Nisha was killed with a knife from her own kitchen. They are desperate to trace what they believe to be the murder weapon. In a high profile case like this, the pressure on the police is immense. That Nisha Patel Nasri was a fellow police officer only adds to the stress. Not long into the investigation, police learn that a few days before her killing, Nisha scared off three men trying to force their way into her home. Was this just a coincidence, or could this previous attack on Nisha's house be connected to her murder? There were three young black men came to the, came to the house. She challenged them at the front door, and they then made off. Now, clearly, it may not be that those matters are linked, but certainly, for me, it is a line of investigation that my team will be undertaking. We know that somebody, we believe a man with a hooded top, has run off down Supri Avenue towards Sylvester Road. Pieces of evidence slowly being gathered are beginning to make police question if Nisha's murder was as random as it first appeared. Detectives believe that on the night of the murder, Nisha took a knife from her own kitchen and used it to confront an intruder. She was then disarmed and stabbed with her own weapon. And it's this missing knife that is the key focus of their investigation. The suspect has arrived at the scene without a knife and left with a knife, so he wouldn't have had a plan beforehand as to what he was going to do with that knife. So I became slightly obsessed that that knife would have been disposed of relatively locally. So quite a significant number of resources went into the search for that knife. Nisha's husband, Faddy, thinks he may have a suspect. Life and your wife's life and your health, you'll return my car now. The threats of violence against Faddy and Nisha are from the owner of another car hire company he's been doing business with. Faddy has fallen out with her over a deal. Early in the investigation, Nasri suggested that the crime may have been committed by people who lived in Scotland. He had sold one of his limousines to a minicab company in Scotland. He said on the agreement that he could borrow it back for one last job. 
Unhappy with the condition of the car she's been sold by Fanny, the owner of the Scottish limo company refuses to lend him the car back as agreed. Fanny responds by using a false name to book the limo. He then travels to Scotland and steals back the vehicle he's just sold. The furious new owner of the car leaves the phone message that Fanny records and hands to the police. No, I'm telling you, and your legs are going to be broken, and this is no idle threat. No, money out that. It's my car, you stupid Now I want my car back now. Are you dead? By this time, Fanny has returned to the stolen limo, but a team from the yard are promptly dispatched to Scotland to assess the seriousness of her threats. So we, we had to investigate the Scottish element of it. I wasn't entirely convinced that as she'd got her car back, she would be sending people to London to harm Nasri or his wife, but threats were made. So we did have to have a robust investigation in that side of it to either implicate or eliminate her from the investigation and we eliminated her so we we're able to move on from that. Back at the scene of the crime, the homicide squad continue their hunt for the murder weapon. A large team of specialist search officers have been working for 10 days. It's a labor intensive and high cost exercise. They've been using a concentric circle search technique, starting from the murder scene and moving outwards. Once you've got past the inner cordon, out of that, you would go further and further out, searching things like waste bins, drains, and anywhere that a knife may be hidden. You go along there with people from the council who use one of those large vacuum devices to suck the contents of the drain out so they can then be examined. Just as they're about to call off the search, investigators spot something. We virtually at the very end of our search parameter, we wouldn't have searched very much further. They lifted a drain cover up and importantly, there was the knife. The drain was fully silted up and as you lift the drain cover up, you could see the knife pushed into the soil at the top of the drain, the handle sticking out um, where it sat for around about 10 days. Now the trouble with a knife that's left for 10 days, it will be attacked by bacteria and DNA is very susceptible to being attacked by bacteria. What happens is the DNA degrades, the bacteria chomps away at it and degrades. But they're in luck. The DNA on the knife hasn't degraded too much and scientists at the lab are able to conduct a successful forensic analysis. We found there was some DNA on the blade of the knife relating to Nisha, so indicating that was her knife and it was the knife that stabbed Nisha. Forensic scientists can say with 100% certainty that this is the weapon that killed Nisha. It's a stunning breakthrough for investigators. We suddenly told to go to a press conference. The police produced a gigantic silver, what looks like a butcher's knife. It's 13 inches long, it's sharp, it's heavy, and we're told this is the knife that killed Nisha Patel Nasri. As the investigation into Nisha's brutal death continues, her family, fellow police officers, and the community grieve her loss. I was at the funeral for Nisha, and I remember the lines of police officers who were really upset about what had happened. Nobody at that stage knowing the reason for the murder or what had happened on the night. So it was a really, really hard moment for us. And unlike most murder funerals, this was one of our own. Although police are still in mourning, the hunt to find Nisha's killer must continue. And though they didn't know it yet, the location of the murder weapon will provide an even more dramatic revelation in the hunt for Nisha's killer. The breakthrough for the detectives was the discovery of a, a piece of CCTV footage which 
may have looked quite innocent, but began to sort of tell a clue about what happened. They found some footage from outside a, a shop nearby the crime scene of a car stopping just for seven seconds and then driving off. Just a few streets from the scene of the crime, on CCTV footage, detectives can see the headlights of a car stop for just long enough and at the right time for a knife to have been dumped down a drain. But it's a darkened night. The number plate isn't readable and the car is an Audi, one of thousands like it in the UK. Identifying that car seems like an impossible task. Finding that Audi was a line of inquiry on its own, and some officers were dedicated just to doing that, whilst other investigations, forensic witness, intelligence, were still ongoing, and others was being collected and viewed. But police are given a sliver of hope. One of the number plate lights wasn't working, and it very much looked like there was an aerial in the centre of the roof and the Audi main dealers told us this wasn't an Audi fit. One team of detectives are tasked with remaining dedicated to the search for the car they believe the murder weapon has been dumped from. Police are now juggling multiple strands of a complex investigation and every possible line of inquiry has to be followed up. In any murder case, Police will always have a natural suspicion of those closest to the victim. But Nisha's husband's alibi checks out. Quite properly, another team of detectives are assigned to check Fadi Nasri's phone records. What they find is surprising. Fadi Nasri keeps some pretty unsavoury company. So he looked at who Nasri himself had been in touch with to get a, a picture of his lifestyle, see what may have brought the attackers to the scene. Fatty is not a suspect in the murder of his wife, as his alibi has checked out. But police suspicions are aroused by a friend he's in regular contact with, a notorious local drug dealer called Roger Leslie. What if Nisha had been the victim of a drug deal gone wrong? Could Fatty have been the intended target, and not Nisha? We looked at that individual, Roger Leslie, who was making the phone calls to and receiving phone calls from. There was nothing to indicate that Leslie had any access to an Audi motor vehicle. Although Leslie did have criminal connections and we didn't know whether Nasri was involved in crime with him. They decide to monitor all phone calls made by Roger Leslie to see if it leads anywhere. This decision turns out to be pivotal in the hunt for Nisha's killer, as it leads them to uncover a suspect. We identified a man called Tony Emmanuel. When he was investigated, it was established that he owned an Audi motor vehicle. People went down to look at that motor vehicle and confirmed it had the aerial on the roof. So that was our first real breakthrough in identifying a suspect who we could actually tie to seeing the owner of that car. We very quickly arrested Emmanuel and seized the car. We interviewed Emmanuel but denied any involvement in the murder. We knew we were moving in the right direction and it, it gave the investigation momentum. Emmanuel admits to being outside Nisha's house at the time of the murder, but insists he was only the driver taking someone else to do a drug deal. He refuses to name his passenger on the grounds it would put his life at risk, and he denies all knowledge of the murder. It had taken six months to, to actually get that breakthrough, and it felt slightly surreal. You get to a stage where you think, it's never gonna happen. The police are making progress. They've found the murder weapon and they've identified the car that drove away from the scene of the crime and dumped that weapon. And they've interviewed Tony Emmanuel, who admits to owning that car and driving it to Nisha's at the time of her murder. So the detectives have bits of a 
complicated jigsaw puzzle, but frustratingly, the pieces aren't fitting together yet. Detectives at New Scotland Yard no longer believe Nisha Patel Nasri's murder was a robbery gone wrong. They've discovered that her husband, Faddy, is friends with a North London drug kingpin called Roger Leslie. And they've also tracked down a man who admits to driving a car to a drug deal outside Nisha's house on the night of her murder. But six months have passed since Nisha's brutal murder and they still don't have her killer. But police do have a lead. Detectives arrest and caution nightclub promoter Tony Emmanuel, who admits he was driving the Audi from which the murder weapon was dumped. Under intense questioning from investigators, Emmanuel gives up the name of his passenger on that fateful night. Local nightclub bouncer, Jason Jones. He said he was at the scene, but remained sitting in a car throughout that period. And the Jones suddenly came running back to the car and told him to drive away. And I remember the way it was presented was that Tony Emmanuel admitted having been there, but it was not to commit any serious crime and that he'd been pushed on it, but he was very scared to say anything. But it was also clear from the investigating team that with a bit of time and a bit of pressure, they thought he would actually turn round, which is what eventually happened. Clearly, we didn't know whether to believe Emmanuel or not. In all probability, if he had been involved in the murder, he wouldn't have told us straight away. Anyway. Investigators now have the circumstantial evidence to charge Tony Emmanuel and Jason Jones but a motive for the killing remains an enigma. It was a long, painstaking investigation for them. I mean, these were months were going by and they weren't getting the leads they needed. They found the knife, but then the trail went cold again. They were determined to crack this case. Questions about the exact sequence of events in the house that terrible night continue to play on Nick Scola's mind. As the investigation developed and we got a better understanding of the crime scene, that began to give me some concerns. The working theory was that Nisha had taken the kitchen knife outside to confront her attackers. The knife itself was in the kitchen at the back of the house. So we have Nisha traipsing from the front of the house to the back to collect a knife, then going upstairs to collect a torch that she didn't really need. But a torch was also found near her collapsed and bleeding body. Why had she taken this torch to confront her killers when the street outside was well lit? There was a great deal about the crime scene that still didn't make sense. Nasri told us he'd double locked the doors before they went out, yet the keys were on the settee in another room. With no sign of a break-in or a struggle in the house, why were Nisha's front door keys found inside? Nisha had foiled an attempted break into her house just a few days before the murder. It had left her so terrified, Faddy had promised to install CCTV. Given her fear, why would she have gone out to confront her attackers this time? The jigsaw pieces of Nisha's death refused to fit neatly together. You just have to keep sifting through it and going back over it to see if information coming in changes. Does, any, does that change the perspective of anything that's already in the system that you know? Since investigating death threats from an angry businesswoman, police have had possession of Fadi Nasri's phone. By analysing his calls, they've already established he counts criminals as his friends. A further search of what's inside his mobile reveals another very disturbing side to the character of Nisha's husband. We downloaded the contents and in doing so, in his photographs, found some pictures of a woman that clearly weren't Nisha and one was of a woman's leg in bed. 
that we didn't believe to be niches. Police confront Faddy about the contents of his phone. We initially asked Nashley about it and he denied any memory of it. That was in July and then in the August he contacted us to say in actual fact he did know who that woman was. He was asked if he was having a sexual relationship with her. He said no, she was just a friend. But later that day, again got back to us and told us that yes, he had been having an affair. Detectives initially showed some sympathy with why Faddy, a grieving husband, would not have told her family about cheating on their beloved Nisha. I perhaps I can understand that he didn't want to admit his affair. It could only cause upset to Nisha's family, who may have been taking some comfort from the fact that she was in a happy relationship as far as many of them were concerned. His mistress may have been part of the motive. He'd only been married three years, but he was having an affair. He was spending huge amounts of money on jewelry and gifts and even a secret holiday to Egypt. Police arrest and interview Laura Faddy's 25-year-old Lithuanian mistress. Though they rapidly rule her out of any involvement in Nisha's murder, her phone contains further proof of Faddy's affair with her and his callous betrayal of the wife who loved him. On her camera, pictures of hers in Egypt with pyramids in the background and a date stamp, so we knew when she was in Egypt. During conversation with Nazri and Nisha's family, we found out that he had visited Cairo himself, supposedly to see a sick uncle. News of the affair was a massive blow to all of Nisha's family and friends, but especially for her brother. I said to him once we'd got told by the doctor that Nisha hasn't made it, I put my hand on his shoulder and I said to him, don't worry, I'll look after you. So finding out about this girlfriend was difficult for us to actually get our heads around. What it must have been like for the family it must have been horrendous. Faddy's carefully presented image of a hard-working businessman and loving husband was coming apart at the seams. As police also dig into Faddy Nasri's finances, they come to realise he was massively in debt and spending money he didn't have. His limousine business was in desperate trouble. He was a terrible businessman. He, he was got in, in debt. He'd actually borrowed the money to, to launch the business from his wife, but he was not making a success of it. Faddy was a man that was living well beyond his means. He had debts that were piling up. He had a mistress that he was lavishing gifts on. It was through investigating Fadi Nasri's deception and his enormous debts that police discover he may have had a motive for murder. During the investigation, we established that two or three months before her murder, Nisha had taken out life insurance to cover the outstanding mortgage on their house. In the event of her death, husband Fadi stood to inherit the lot. This revelation changed everything. So all of this, you know, looked very, very suspicious and, you know, was very heavy circumstantial evidence against him. The trust Nisha's brother had placed in Fadi Nasri is replaced with suspicion. There wasn't anything before. He was cleaning cars for a living. He was a, he was a car valet. And then after me and my sister, you know, she turned him into a a uh, 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 limousine businessman. Investigators now had Fadi Nasri firmly in their sights. This was a person who was used to using women for his own end. And this was a person who was in a very difficult place financially. Police now know Fadi has been living a lie. He's been cheating on his wife with a glamorous younger woman and he's developed some very expensive spending habits. His friends are crooks and his business is in huge debt. And whilst Faddy has his airtight alibi, police are now combing through every phone call he's ever made. A 
young woman has been viciously slaughtered on her own front doorstep. But seven months after the crime, the perpetrators have still evaded justice. Following Nisha's murder, friends, family and police initially believed Fatty as the grieving widower. He came over as genuine. He was concerned, he was distraught. He said, I need help, I need to find my wife's killers. But in retrospect, you look back and there is no emotion. Fadi Nasri had seemed like a respectable, hard-working businessman. But Nick Scola's new Scotland Yard team have established that he appears to be friends with a notorious local criminal. Since realising that Faddy mixes with people on the wrong side of the law, police have been tracking all his calls and those of local drug dealer Roger Leslie. What you can build up through analysis is a network of phones that are talking to each other at certain times, and you put that together with other evidence, witness statements, CCTV, you can start to find who's talking to who using what phone. They've also been monitoring the phones of Jason Jones and Tony Emmanuel, who they've already linked to the murder. Bit by bit, police analysts are building up a complex grid of phone information on and around the night of the murder. Who called who, when and why. The data is carefully mapped, so detectives can draw information from the patterns of calls between the men under surveillance. That type of analysis is how we got to the point of some suspects. It was then the investigation, the interviewing that took us from there to actually getting the evidence about who's committed the crime. In the course of gathering this information, detectives noticed something highly suspicious about the timing of the calls. As we went through his phone calls, we began to notice a pattern of phone calls going backwards and forwards between him and one other person specifically. And those phone calls were happening right up until the time of the crime and shortly after the crime. Police now know that Faddy is thoroughly disreputable and possibly criminal. They suspect him of involvement in Nisha's murder, but he's always had an airtight alibi. He was playing snooker with a friend, and the whole thing is captured on CCTV. But could new Scotland Yard detectives have missed something? And in particular, we looked at his alibi witness again. We discovered something we didn't know before. Nasri had received a call from the scene from one of the neighbours had come out and seen his wife had been stabbed. But he had received a call before that. When you check the phone records, the first telephone call after the stabbing that Nasri receives is from Roger Leslie, shortly after he has been phoned by Jones, who was at the scene. So the attack carries out, Jones phones Leslie, Leslie phones Nasri. The pieces are finally fitting together. You know, bingo, they, they found the phone calls on the night of the murder, before the murder, around that time, between him and Roger Leslie. Through middleman Roger Leslie, police can now make a direct link from Faddy Nasri to Jason Jones, the man that they believe fatally stabbed Faddy's wife. At last, they can put Nisha's seemingly innocent and loving husband in the frame for her murder. And that's when they had their sort of eureka moment and realized that he was at the heart of the whole thing. Police now believe Faddy ordered a cold-blooded hit. They also had a clear picture of what they believed happened to Nisha on that fateful night. Nisha was upstairs and Jones let himself in with keys that had been left out for him. He may have had the knife with him already, but Nisha went downstairs to see what's happening 
and she most probably encountered Jones further into the house, now coming towards her. So leaving the property was her escape route, which is how she came to be outside and moving away from her house with Jones in pursuit. We think that's how it unfolded. When they meet Nasri and confront him, his response is totally unexpected. He burst into tears, sobbed incessantly, almost as if it was a way of not having to talk to us, would absent himself from the room to go to the toilet to compose himself, come back in, and then burst into tears again, to the point where he answered no questions. Police believe they have enough evidence to convict Fadi Nasri. He had used his criminal friend to act as a middleman and callously ordered the murder of his wife. It had taken many months of painstaking police work to place Fadi Nasri in the frame for murder and even longer to gather the evidence to prove his guilt. But in February 2007, police finally charge him with the murder of his wife. Almost two years after Nisha's brutal killing, four men stood trial at the Old Bailey, charged with her murder. It was a long trial and it was a very tense trial. I mean, it was a packed court. The media box was absolutely full. Detectives felt they'd built a strong case, but securing convictions was not a foregone conclusion. These cases are always difficult for juries because although the evidence was good, it was all circumstantial. There was no forensic evidence placed them directly at the scene. This was a case that had absolutely captured people's imagination. And we got to the end and the jury went out and they were out for six days and that was really tense. I tried to stay calm, you know. I was just pretty much trying to keep busy reading a book, doing a crossword in, in, in the newspaper, just trying to keep my mind occupied. It was just a matter of waiting and hoping. On the sixth day of deliberation, the jury came back to deliver their verdicts. You could have heard a pin drop. Everyone is holding their breath and the verdicts come. The first is not guilty. And that makes everyone incredibly tense. But after that, the verdicts come one after another, guilty, 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 guilty. And the relief on the faces of the family, the relief on the faces of the police, memorable. Though Tony Emmanuel, the driver, was found not guilty, middleman Roger Leslie was sentenced to 18 years. Jason Jones, who fatally stabbed Nisha, and Fadi Nasri, the man who betrayed her and ordered her murder, both get 20 years minimum. This woman that he'd met five months earlier and convinced himself that she was going to be the woman of his dreams and that's why he killed his wife and he was going to live this magical life on the life insurance and nobody would ever suspect anything. I mean, what a fool. For detectives, it was a vindication of all their hard work. Fadi Nasri himself throughout this has shown himself to be a deceitful man, an arrogant and selfish man, and ultimately a very ruthless man who was prepared to kill so that he could gain financially and be with his younger mistress. Justice was finally served for Nisha.